everyone. Welcome to My Immigration Story. I am your host, Sujata Ramteke. This is an ongoing sh show where we bring to you stories of immigrants from different backgrounds, and we hope to shed some light on the challenges faced by the immigrants in US. And today we have with us our guest, Yasin Alkaryani. Welcome, Yasin. My pleasure, thank you. So Yasin, tell us a little bit about yourself, like um, where are you basically from? Uh, what is your educational background and what do you currently do? Uh, so I am a, an information technology consultant and you could say I'm an entrepreneur in general. So I try to open businesses and run them and then just, uh, just help people and at the same time help myself. Uh, I live in Teaneck, New Jersey. Uh, I've lived here for the past 13 years, but I've been in the United States uh, for uh, 16 years now, coming to mm -hmm. it from Morocco. Um, I Educational background, I hold a bachelor's degree from Morocco in management information systems. I came to the United States, worked for a little bit, then went back for my master's degree. I have an MBA uh, with a concentration in entrepreneurship. And I like to believe that I am a public servant. I spend a good deal of my time volunteering, helping people. I guess that's my that's my hobby, pretty much, is just uh, doing as many good things as possible uh -huh. for for other people, be it through nonprofit organizations, be it through the government of the city where I uh, where I reside. And I'm here to share. Uh, I hope, what what it will turn out to be an interesting um, story. Yeah, we, we sure do. Um, so you said you have been in US for like 16 years. That's that's quite a long time. Um, so when you first moved from Morocco to US, like what, what was your visa status? Did you come on a student visa or how was it? Oh, I came with a green card. So uh, oh, okay. my brother moved to the United States in 1989. He applied mm -hmm. green card for my mom and then my mom applied for me. And that's how most of my siblings have obtained their uh, legal status in the United States. Mm -hmm. So is it like a complicated process when you try to get the green card right where you are there, like in your home country, or do you have like a lot of documentation? What's what's the general process? Like walk us through the process. Well, I, I don't recall the process, frankly speaking. I was much younger when the, the whole thing started, but I recall that I had a hard time with immigration to retain my green card, especially... Oh, okay. the it in 2005 mm -hmm. and I was still in college so my family had made the decision that I should stay in Morocco to finish college before I move completely to the United States but I had a hard time retaining um, uh, my green card at that time uh, and that caused me a great deal of uh, of hardship uh, but eventually I mean once you're stable then I think all the um, challenges I guess gradually vanish and then you'll have mm -hmm. these uh, occasional situations that may happen at an airport here and there, which is what we, uh, which is not that bad now, but I would say 10 years ago, 12 years ago, 13 years yeah. ago was a little uh, strict. We call it uh, flying while Muslim. So uh, we used to have some of that, uh, especially with the, uh, at the airports. Yeah. So where like previously when you, you said you were in, in college and it was hard to you know, kind of maintain that green card status. Why, why did you not like, um, you know, try to get to U.S. for your studies? Uh, it, it, was, it was a matter of cost. Uh, mm. it, it's more expensive to go to college in the right. U.S. Uh, uh, stay in, in Morocco. So that was the key thing it was just a matter of cost, pretty much. Yeah. So um, now when you were there like a long time back, now when you travel, do you still have those issues? To, to an extent where it gets kind of frustrating to, okay, it's been a long time, like, you know, 16 years I'm in US and I'm still facing those issues when I go to immigra immigration or do, do you feel that frustration or that those challenges? I think once you're a US citizen, that the, 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 the um, challenges diminish as opposed mm -hmm. to an immigrant, both, both from an administrative perspective and a psychological perspective. When you are US citizen, you know you have way more rights than somebody who's a permanent uh, resident. Right. So once you obtain your citizenship, then it becomes easier and it becomes more, um, I guess, refreshing, relieving, relieving to, 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 uh, to, uh, to, uh, 
to know that, hey, listen, you can defend yourself versus the government can find a way to throw you out. So yeah. I'm not concerned, although I may have had some incidents here and there. I mean, the whole notion of uh, uh, special treatment at an airport does not distinguish between a resident and a citizen, but the frequency of that um, has definitely diminished over the years. Mm -hmm. So um, when you first came to US, um, did you like have a hard time adjusting to, uh, you know, considering the language barriers or any other challenges or barriers that you thought that, you know, were like overwhelming to you when you when you got here? Definitely. I mean, I think when I think about it, it's all funny now. Like, I mean, I, I came to the U.S. having learned English, so I did. I was not mm. like completely clueless about the English language. But I, I think the English that I learned was for the most part formal. So right. then when I come here, I can read books. I can speak correct English but then somebody speaks to me in slang and I just look at the person and start smiling pretending that what I'm understanding <laughs> and I ask them like <laughs> yeah okay <laughs> or I ask them what did you mean stuff like that but uh, yes I had um, I had uh, my challenge um, um, I guess um, integrating but I made it my business to to say you know what I think this country is great it has mm -hmm. offered me great opportunity to excel and a great environment where I can do my best and demonstrate results. So it's my business to be a, a full-fledged uh, uh, U.S. citizen and get right. involved and exercise my responsibilities mm -hmm. and at the same time defend my rights as much as possible. Right, true, true. Um so, you know, for me, like I'm immigrant too, it's been almost it, more than eight years now, um, you know, I, I'm here. But when I came here, I had a problem with a little bit with accent. You mm. know, it was difficult to kind of understand uh, sometimes what people are saying. Now I work with UK people. So now I'm used to English accent, but now I work with UK people. So when I joined, it took me a good six months to kind of, you know, understand the accent uh, of the English accent. So I always felt like it's like from one thing to another. I learned now American accent. Now I have to learn, uh, you know, uh, English accent. So it's it's always like learning from one thing to another. When I was in India, I worked with the U.S. clients. When I was in the U.S., I'm working with the U U.K. client. So right. it's it's like full circle going like, you know, in, in circles. So it's it's very interesting the, how the language can become, you know, um, sometimes a cause of frustration, but sometimes also fun to kind of, oh, this, you know, this means that. And, uh, OK, I'm learning new accent. And my friends have started noticing that my accent has changed uh, and I get frequent, you know, um, uh, reminders that hey you are speaking in you know american accent come back to indian accent so i, I do face that a lot do you, do, do you face that too when, when you talk uh, to yeah, your friends i in think it's Norfolk? it's not the same because i guess in india people who are educated do speak english like yeah yeah good amount morocco, of population it's a little bit different english. in morocco people speak their local dialect for the most mm -hmm. part it is the arabic uh the, what we call derija which is the arabic pretty much a, a, a branch of Arabic, if you'd like, or slang Arabic, if you'd like. There are other people that speak uh, Amazigh language, uh, but then the second language for everybody, for the most part, uh, is is French, then, mm -hmm. or sometimes Spain. But English is, is a third language, so the percentage of people that speak English is very low, so there is no... Hey, by the way, your accent changed because most people don't, uh, don't, don't speak. Don't recognize, yeah. Right, right. 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 Great, great. Um, I want to ask you about the cultural shock. Like, you know, some things are definitely like Morocco has its own cultural tradition. Uh, American cultural tradition is different. What what was that that one thing that like a cultural shock that, oh, my God, this is completely different than than what I have in, in Morocco? What, what was that for you? I don't recall having a cultural shock. Because I came with, I mean, I studied um, secularism and I studied uh, um, immigration. 
It was mm. a topic of interest of mine. And then I see how Moroccan immigrants um, live in different countries. So I do distinguish, for example, between living in Europe, not because I lived in Europe, I did not, but through my family members and friends, versus living in the United States or even living in Canada. So I argue mm -hmm. that when you live in Europe, European countries or secular countries that are, in my humble opinion, anti-foreigners. Like there is a there is a uh, a, a you, if you would call it a homogeneous culture that they are trying to maintain as much as possible. It's not easy, but for the most part, most of European countries are trying to maintain mm -hmm. that. Uh, you could argue the same exact thing about Quebec and Canada or British Columbia or anything like that. But in the United States, it is a salad. It's different ingredients yeah. chopped together. Multicultural, put together, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and everybody has the opportunity to inject their own culture into the mix. So I, I, I've i always come with that mindset. I didn't change my name. I mm -hmm. did not um, accept to uh, not practice my religious um, obligations in the public setting. Mm -hmm. uh, I am who I am. And I believe my culture and my um, attributes are as American as anybody else's attributes. True, true. Um, do you, ha do you think that there are, um, I'm just going to pivot a little bit. Um, uh, do you think there are any like social taboos that exist in, in Morocco that you think U.S. doesn't have it and you feel like you're better off it? Like, do, do you feel that way sometimes? That there are social taboos in Morocco that don't exist in the United States? Yeah. And you feel like that. Okay, I'm I'm better off it. Like I'm I'm great that I'm here, and I don't have to go through you know that thing. I don't think so. I think for the most part, Moroccans and the Moroccan society, um, given its um, its geographic location, has always been open to other cultures. Has always mm -hmm. obtained the best from other cultures, while at the same time, it has always maintained its roots. So there is nothing ever we're in the, the world is a small village at this point. So I don't think there is anything in uh, in um, in Morocco that is a taboo uh, that here I feel like, oh, you know what? I'm glad I'm here. I don't really need to address it in Morocco. So uh, I'm glad I'm here. I, I, I had I been in Morocco, I would find it awkward. No, I think for the most part, the Moroccan culture has been uh, has been open, has been um flexible, has been receptive mm -hmm. to other views, to other cultures. So I am proud uh, uh, to be an American. And at the same time, I am equally proud of being somebody who grew up, uh, was born and grew up in a culture and a country as rich as Morocco. Right. So you you don't find the, the, the culture of like Moroccan more restrictive uh, than America? You, you don't see that? Uh, distinction i think uh, i think uh, uh, morocco as a country has people who are close to each other in terms of the beliefs mm. i think morocco for the most part is able to uh, acknowledge and receive others whereas the united states is a country that has more diversity given the fact that it, the united states offers more opportunities for people to immigrate mm economy is better you can make money here there's better education etc uh, so i don't think that it is stricter in morocco i did not live a strict life in morocco we were able to do everything that anybody would do i, I lived my teens and my early 20s in morocco i did every crazy thing that that a teenager american or, teen would do <laughs> I, I think maybe 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 the american teens can learn a thing or two from moroccan teens who grew up <laughs> Well, sometimes maybe you might want to enlighten the teens of of America what they can, what they are missing. <laughs> maybe, yeah. <laughs> awesome. Um, on the flip side, I want to ask: um, Are there like things that you miss that you really, really enjoyed in Morocco, but you know it's not as great in in it, you it, you might experience things the same things but not it, it's not as great as uh, what it was in morocco are there family. Any like that family like in morocco i had my ex i have my extended family there so mm -hmm. it was 
easy to just um, go travel see, uh, over the weekend to see your aunt or your uncle, um, which we don't. I don't have that luxury here. I mean, there is me and three uh, three uh, siblings. Uh, we don't have the luxury of cousins. We don't have the luxury of aunts, uncles. Um, my, our parents visit once in a while, but that's the key thing: is to be able to spend some unproductive time with your family members, <laughs> extended family members, having. I, to... I like how you put that in <laughs> unproductive time. <laughs> well, yeah, because I'm big on productivity, that's the thing. I'm yeah, crazy. I, I can tell. I can tell you, you have a PMP certification. Like I can tell, you have a project management certification. I can tell. <laughs> right. So I'm all about getting things done and moving. So even like in the US, I think I'm more productive than most people who live here. I don't resting is not something that i do on a regular basis i just i'm just used to it but i'm i i, I miss just sitting uh, on a couch sipping tea cookies just talking nonsense and politics and <laughs> soccer and all these different things i haven't I, I i wish i wish i'm able to do that more often yeah i i feel the same um you now that you mentioned i went to india last uh, last year for almost three months i have worked from home so um, I work from there, but you know, it was so, uh, great that you don't have to call anybody or your extended relatives to kind of go to their house. You just do, kind of show up, uh, and, uh, they will entertain you and you can talk, like, as you said, unproductive things for, for hours and you kind of feel rejuvenated by that somehow for, for no good reason, but you do feel that. And I do miss that sometimes here that, you know, you always have to talk sense sometimes, like I miss that nonsense talk. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. Yeah, I, I I relate. Awesome. Um, I do want to um uh, ask you about um the current crisis um that is there in Morocco and um you know if you can enlighten our viewers about what is happening and and are there any ways if people are you know working on it any um you know or all those updates. Yeah. So. Uh, I, I really thank you for that question. Um, now, we all enjoy, when we live in the United States for the most part, we enjoy our luxurious life. Mm -hmm. uh, but sometimes uh, a country gets hit with some shock that moves everybody. Today, um, as, as we're doing this interview, I'm sure it's going to be published later, but today is September 11th. September 11th was an event that shook the United States of America. I think Morocco two days ago had um, something similar, an earthquake that has to, 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 to date taken over 2,400 lives. Uh, my family lives there. So I was, I was devastated Friday night. But my family does not live in the areas that are close to where the uh, the the um, concentration of damage was mm -hmm. but I know other people that did so my wake-up call was Saturday morning I woke up a friend of mine sent me a message I called her she said I lost 20 members of my family wow so that was a wake-up call dear. yeah so it's a devastating issue but at the same time I remain hopeful we've been making efforts to raise money to send money to Morocco I know mm -hmm. other or are, are, are getting putting together like tents, medication, other things that are going to be shipped. And this is an opportunity for everybody to demonstrate our humanity. Because here we're talking about immigration and the differences in cultures and the culture shock and how we try to integrate, assimilate, etc. And then what taboos are there. But I think there is something that brings everybody together is the sense of humanity is striving so that each one can retain and live a life. No matter how good, bad, average, different, same, a life. So I urge everybody to do their part and find ways that are legitimate mm -hmm. so that they can help um, those in need in Morocco. Because I think um, America is a country of, of generous people. Americans are great donors. Yeah. And this is something that is that i think is unique to the united states and unique to 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 this ecosystem where we live so i urge everybody to participate and help as much as they can 
Yeah, I think we have seen that, um, you know, generous heart of United States when the, you know, the Ukraine crisis happened. So many people volunteered to actually go and fight with with the Ukrainians. So, um, you know, I'm sure uh, viewers will find a way to help uh, Moroccan people, um, you know, connect with the communities, um, NGOs that are supporting uh, in the cause. And we do really hope that uh, Morocco comes out of this, um, you know, soon. From, the, from this tragedy. Yeah, and again, um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to spread this message. Uh, if There are various ways people can assist Morocco right now, uh, but because we're doing a great deal of vetting and contact with organizations, there are two ways I ask people to do to in order to help. Two things I ask them to do. One, they can call 1424 Morocco. This is our helpline where people can call and seek information about ways to assist. The other way is to go to uh, mymaroc.org. That's m y m a r o c.org and there they will find the latest information about how to assist and everybody is uh, welcome and urged to do their part. I mean, and thank you for sharing those uh, insights and and those uh, statistics. You know, they kind of bring light to what exactly is happening and kind of make you know people aware that what they should be doing, how grave the damage is. So thank you so much. Absolutely. Uh, pivoting from that, um, I want to ask you. Um, you had green card when when you were in Morocco. Um, you had plans of coming to United States. Uh, so did you have like an American a dream like everybody has? And um, did you achieve that dream yet? Um, I did have a dream when I first got my green card was to make as much money as possible, um, wear uh, uh, Versace pants and Gucci sunglasses. And I did some <laughs> of that the first two years. I mean, I was just like, spending money on me and then just going out and enjoying my time with friends, etc. But I think as we as we age, and I'm not an old man, I'm 37, <laughs> I'm going to turn 38 this week, um, I think our priorities changed. And given the exposures sure. that we require, I think our goals change. So my dream right now is to just live a life where I have as much impact as possible, uh, where I accumulate as many uh, good deeds as possible, because as a Muslim man, uh, Islam is not a. Is, it's not easy to be Muslim. You have to really earn your uh, your seat in heaven. So you have to do your best, so that you can hopefully get there. Um, so that's my goal right now. That's my dream. Have I achieved that? I think that's not a dream that I'm gonna be able to achieve. But I think the um, the flavor and the great taste is going to be in the journey. Yeah, I think, yeah, I, that's what I was about to say. Like your dream is doesn't have a specific destination, but it's kind of a journey that you have to just go through in your life and see what possible ways you can find out to do and achieve whatever, you know, you have in your mind to help people and, you know, help in the humanitarian causes. And I, I think that's going to be a, a journey. I definitely um, We are coming towards the end. I would like to ask like any last parting thoughts that you have for our viewers? Well, thank you for having me. I think uh, the idea is brilliant to have a show like this where you highlight the different journeys of individuals who have immigrated to the United States. Uh, all I can say is that uh, I hope the viewers enjoy it. Uh, let us stay united. Let us embrace one another. And God bless the United States of America. Thank you so much, Yasin. It was so lovely to have you and, you know, hear your views, your opinions, um, you know, hearing the story of you coming from Morocco, adjusting to United States, your aims, ambitions. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. You know, it was very refreshing to kind of hear all that. Um, thank you for uh, being on the show. It was lovely Likewise. to have you. Thank you for having me. I appreciate you. Thank you, everyone. You're watching My Immigration Story. I'm your host, Sujata Ramteke. And you can catch this show on local channels or, or you can go on our websites, fcta.org. I'll see you next time. <music>